name is Edward Haletke, and this is the Virtualization and Cloud Security video podcast series. And I'm here with Pamela Dingle, who is the Principal Technical Architect at Ping Identity. And what else do you do over at Ping? Yeah. Uh, I have the best job ever. Uh, I get to watch identity standards and uh, the trends in the identity world. And I get to try to apply that uh, with the other people on my team to how we make our products. And uh, I also get to travel a lot and speak at conferences about identity and identity standards. Well, the standards part, that's eh, kind of dull, but. <laughs> I love it, I love it. You love it. Actually, the standard stuff is actually incredibly important because without standards for identity, we wouldn't be able to intercommunicate between our computers in ourselves and anything. The whole cloud business would fall on its backside. Um, Absolutely. So, we need standards and identity standards are actually have been changing over the last few years, specifically with a lot of federated cloud identity stores and using clouds themselves as an identity store. That's been rather intriguing to watch. Yes, absolutely. And the nice thing about it is when you authenticate to a cloud, um, they're a lot better at authenticating you than you know, your general website that puts up a login form, right? And matches a string that you type in against a string that they stored in a database. Well, you know, you know most clouds still do that, but I mean, this, is, this has been a common theme throughout. Unless you enable two-factor authentication, it's only going to be as good as matching things. Well, I, I, I disagree in some ways because uh, what's happening right now in these big multi-tenant um, cloud authenticators like Salesforce or Google, are that they're looking at uh, where you are, they're looking at what device you're on, they're looking at what your physical. Uh, well, you know, they're bringing in multiple factors. They're bringing in other factors. They are, and those factors are passive, which yes. to me is the future of identity, right? Because I don't believe we're going to get rid of passwords altogether. I believe that no. passwords will simply become one of a number of things that make you safe instead of the only thing that makes you safe. Well, the future may be that when you get your social security card or you get whatever identity card you get when you enter a company and I'm going to try this. I just froze. Um, when you get your identity card from the, the government, you're going to get a you may end up getting a certificate with it. And if you share that certificate, you're I mean, this is the ultimate in PKI. It's what they do in a lot of different locations already. Yes. It, it's also a correlation key. <laughs> it's what it is. It is. To death. <laughs> it needs to be done, but it needs to be done in such a way that it's actually going to be usable. Yeah, I agree. Well, as is, I mean, a social security number is a correlation key too, right? And yes. as a Canadian, so I'm originally from Canada, when I came to the U.S. and went to my first optometry appointment, and I realized that every optometrist in the United States has access to look up social security numbers? Yes. I was horrified. Uh, you know, as an identity person, I was horrified. Well, SSN is not a piece of identity. It really is not. It's just a number that represents you, but you can't really use it for much. Matter of fact, in the United States, there are laws against people actually asking for it. Well, that's true, but most consumers don't know that those laws exist. Well, now and, we know. And, you know, from a psychology perspective, people just give out information when they get asked. Have yes. you ever noticed that? Uh, I'm shocked. I mean, it, it, for example, when you go to Ikea and they ask you for your um, postal code, you don't have to give it. No, you don't. Make something up. Yeah, I do. You can say I give no them one, two, three, four, five. Right. And yet, look at me going one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> yeah. When people are confronted, they, you know, they do this very quick analysis of is it good or bad? And if they can't find anything bad about it, they tend to just give the information. Right. And True. It's problematic, I think, from, uh, you know, from our perspective as people who are trying to help the world be a safer place. And the pro thing is, is they don't actually need to ask for it. Right. And the reason why they don't need to really ask for it is most people are not paying with cash. They're paying with a credit card or a debit card. And that information is part of that. It is, although my understanding is the PCI segments some of that. It does. And you guys realize what they're doing it for is they're doing it to figure out where to put their next store. And if you want to help them do that, that's fine. But right. they assume they have the right to know. 
And until the companies change to protect your own, your personal consumer privacy, that's, n in, that's not going to change. And people are still going to give it up. Yeah. And that actually goes in, leads nicely into what we want to talk about this, this um, podcast. And that is when you start thinking about how to make those changes as individuals, we can say, hey, I'm not going to give that information. Personally, I don't. Company asks me, oh, I need your driver's license to do a return. I just look at them and say, no, you don't. Let's use yours. Right. What they're trying to do is prevent fraud. Find some other means besides personal identifiable information to prevent fraud. But they go, oh, but that's the law. It's like, no, it's not. That's company policy. Their law is very yes. different. Do not yes, quote law to me. And if someone says that to me, I say, okay, give me, chat. give me the law, the number, the book it's in, and everything. And if they don't know... Don't tell me it's the law because it's not. Right. And there's a lot of people say, well, that's just the law and people believe them. It's like, no, it's not. Well, you know, I think people have this um, right that they don't know they have to simply challenge. All yes. you have to do, uh, I mean, just like you said, all you have to do is challenge it. Why do you want it? Why is it important? Show me the policy, right? Most salespeople, you know, will certainly back down and some will come back with a legitimate reason in, or they'll go get their manager and the manager will come to you and says, well, I'm sorry, we can't accept that. And, I say, and then you can turn around and say, I'm sorry, I can't shop here anymore. Right. Absolutely. But it's funny that it's so much easier to challenge real people in yes. real situations because real people can back down. Whereas if you're signing, you know, if you're downloading an app on your mobile phone, you don't get that luxury of looking people in the eye and asking them why. You just see a list, often a very scary list of what uh, this app is going to be able to consume about you, like your Wi-Fi activity and you know your location everywhere you go. Um, but you have to balance this. People have to make this snap decision of how badly they want this app. And I don't think people really understand what they give up for that snap decision. Well, and I agree with you, but most of the time I turn off location services. I mean, it's one of the things I do as a matter of course, but then again, I've been trained to do that. Right. And, that, and I think that's really the key here is, is that how can you train the consumer to care about their privacy? Right. Right. How, how can people be paranoid, right, without necessarily having it consume their lives? Because nobody wants it to consume their lives. Well, you know, people say I'm paranoid and the answer is no, I'm not. I just have the right mindset. I have a mindset that questions and protects my privacy, my family's privacy my children's privacy, and I'm doing it to protect my family. That's the right. key. So I would call that street smart. Yeah. Right? That's the same thing that anyone would encourage their children, you know, to have as a skill as they're out there in the big, wild, evil world. So yeah, why is it most, a bad thing? But most parents don't know they need to give their children those skills. Right. I think most parents are less street smart, smart than their kids are when it comes when to digital devices. And to a certain extent, giving them the, those street smarts, as you say, was actually would protect them from stuff like cyberbullying. Right. Right. Well, not only that, I don't, I don't know if this is true for you, but the people I know who are most savvy about protecting their accounts are people with accounts like, uh, you know, World of Warcraft, for example. Yeah. Right. I mean, they get how to protect that account because they don't want their stuff stolen. Right. Exactly. They have digital goods in there and they don't want their stuff stolen. And that's a whole different world to, I would say, most people who are older who don't really have digital stuff. Right. They don't think of it well, as. Stuff. But the thing is, is they do. And and we have a digital life today. I don't care how old you are. You do. Mm -hmm. And once you lose access to parts of your digital life, like, for example, if you happen to, again, protect your family. If your parents have a bank account that you don't know about and they only log into it via an um, online account because it's out of the country or out of the state, once that knowledge is gone, the account is gone. Right. So what we've been doing here at my house and with my family is building up our digital life by using tools like 1Password and others to not only look at and say, hey, I want to secure my environment by having good passwords and not making sure making sure my bank accounts don't all have the same password, 
right? You know, it's a good idea. Um, but it also is like, it's amazing what it collects of, oh, that's part of my digital life. I never thought about that. You know, as you log in, it collects the stuff. And that's actually a really good way of building it up. And then you just share the repositories, lock things in safes, and you got yourself a nice little digital life thing that needs to now be considered part of your will. Right. It is an asset. Right. Absolutely. It is. And it, it should be part of the will because imagine the estate, whoever has to deal with your estate, imagine if they had no access to any account. Or and no they won't. Of any account you had. And they won't unless you can give it to them. Yep, absolutely. This actually started about five or six years ago. This started becoming a really huge thing, and it still is. And I, the law is still unsettlingly not conclusive. Right. But if it's you true. lose the password, you lose the account name, you lose the fact that that was there, that money's gone. That could benefit your family. So it behooves you to protect it. <laughs> but when I start thinking about that, I start thinking about, you know, how do we train the people even to look at that? Right. Well, the funny thing is, uh, the password itself is in some ways the least of your problems, right? Yes. Because, um, you know, it's true that some bad guy could come and, and guess your password if you've done something really stupid, like call it, you know, password. For example, which well, remember that's with an a, the, the at sign in there instead of an O. That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but but there's also I think the thing that people aren't as um, knowledgeable about is the reset, the password reset that almost every website offers. Yes. So if you do lose your password, it can be reset, and the the incredible risk that people um, incur when they don't pay attention to how that password is reset. So for example, if you use a terrible password for your email and you use a great password for your bank, it kind of doesn't matter because all that has to happen is the attacker goes to your bank and says, I've forgotten my password. Oh shucks, shucky darn. And they go off to the link to the bank and there's an easy password there. So, uh, you know, this idea that people are gonna concentrate on the weakest link and just knowing that there is a set of links that you need to be aware of, it, I, I think that that's something that we could raise a huge amount of awareness about. Well, and, and you think about it is if I've broken into your bank account, I've probably already broken into other things, mail being one of them. You know, password resets don't have to go over the mail, but a lot of them are now going over SMS. It's like, look, if I'm accessing the bank through my phone, and I do a password reset, it's a pretty good idea. You shouldn't be sending an SMS. <laughs> right. I'm on the device. I own the device. It's mine now. You know, I've broken that password on the device. Now you're sending me that to my device. Uh, right. Not a good idea. Well, the, the other attack that's happening right now is uh, <laughs> it's really important where you enter that SMS, right? Yes. So uh, if the bank puts up uh, the same form for you to enter your password and enter your SMS, then if there's a guy who's put up a fake form and they're phishing you, right, then you're going to enter both the password and the code they send you an SMS into the same form. Yeah. Which is being, which is a, what we call a man in the middle attack, right? Yes. And it doesn't help you that the SMS message arrived via a different channel, which is really the security backdrop to this, right? That they're trying to send things over different channels to be sure um, that, that nobody's being fooled, right? But when the user is voluntarily typing it into the same identical form at the same time as the password, then if they've been fooled once, they're going to get fooled twice and the attacker gets in either way, right? And that depends on how you get into it. I mean, in order for an attacker to deface a, a bank enough to provide an, an external form, Right. It's incredibly hard, but right. it's not incredibly hard if a link comes in through your email and you actually click on it. Right. So, I mean, my my thing is about if you see a link in an email to a bank account, go to directly to the bank site. Absolutely. Don't click on anything in your email unless you absolutely, absolutely know it's the right thing. Go direct to the site and then do it there. I mean, over the weekend, there was a huge number of Apple attacks, um, phishing attacks. Yeah, I have an Apple account. 
it wasn't something I bought to check it. I didn't click on the link. I went to my Apple Store account and looked. It's don't click on these links if you don't know what it is. And it's like three or four of them come in. I'll guarantee you it's unrelated. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think people need to know too about the difference between a targeted attack versus an opportunistic attack. That was right? opportunistic. So that was an opportunistic. You're right. So they sent off, you know, some evil dude somewhere sent off, you know, a million emails to a million people saying, oh my gosh, your Apple account, it's toast. Right. And oh, they, no, you bought some. It was basically you bought something for this very, very high price. Uh, if you didn't agree, click on this link you right, know, that, okay. to verify it. The problem is I got four of those. I'm going, I don't have I'm trying to figure out how I got four accounts. Right. Yeah, that's a bit of an indicator. Um, but the idea, though, that is, I mean, the profit model behind it is that they might send a million emails. and Maybe only five people are dumb enough to click it. Right. But those five people fund the, the bad guy to do it again and again. Um, right. So the, I bet the ratio is more than five. It probably is. It probably is. It would be interesting to know just how many people click. But, you know, people are getting better. So, yes. you know, if you think of the Nigerian prince scams out there. Yes. I, I do think that there must be diminishing returns. For those guys, whoever they are, people. Those are opportunistic because they really didn't do their research. I mean, I'm not a Nigerian prince. I'm sorry, I don't look like one. There's no way. You didn't do your best. I mean, I look at that and go, uh, yeah, no, not me. Right, right. Um, but, you know, when, the, when it comes to spear phishing, where they're actually doing much more, people have done their research or they've listened into certain conversations at the pub. They've listened in all over to say, hey, you know, I know a little bit more about this person. I may not know everything, but I know enough to get them interested. This is the whole social engineering aspect of attacks. And that's just never going to change. Social yeah. engineering is here to stay. I mean, Kevin Mitnick actually now is teaching classes on not how to do it, but how to protect yourself from it. And this is, he knows how, he knows what he's talking about. He knows how to do this very, very well. Right. So I'm glad he's finally educating people. So if people are interested, they could look that up on the web. But I saw that I'm going, now this is fascinating. A guy that really knows how to do it well is going to at least teach you how to protect yourself from that type of attack. And it had nothing to do with the corporation. It had everything to do with personal. Right. Well, I, I do think that there are some simple things people can do to protect themselves. Um, you know, especially in a corporate world. In a corporate world, first of all, um, you you should be preventing domain spoofing, right? I mean, there are there are protocols for prevention of domain spoofing uh, that you know your administrator should be dealing with. But aside from that, just simply clicking down and looking at the actual email address rather than the what we call the reply to, you yes. know, the the first name last name. If if you do that on a regular basis then uh, the, the spear phishing attacks get harder because now they have to both spoof the username and the email address and the context to make sure that- And uh, several other headers that they don't know about. Right, absolutely. So even, you know, there's, there's just a down arrow that you can click to look at the headers of the, of the email and you don't have to be a master email expert, right? You can True. just take a gander through it and if something looks weird, then at least you're, you're tipped off. And really, that's the big thing is how do you arouse suspicion in your population? Well, and that comes down to is, uh, again, you need to be able to train the people that that's what they need to look at. And they need to look at that even in their own, own, own personal life. This has nothing to do with corporations. It has to right? be their personal right. life. If I can train people just not to click on things, which I have, and that's been great in my family, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a long uphill battle. Right. It's right. not going to change. You've got, still got a long uphill battle, but I've actually trained some people not to do that. And once they do that, then it's like all the attacks suddenly went away. It's like, okay, we now know what the primary, primary attack was. Right. But when you start thinking about spear phishing, there's people that know a lot about you. There's, a, there's an old saying that was in World War II, and I wrote this in my la one of my last articles on this, is that loose lips sh sink ships. Just don't talk about it. Biggest thing you could do to, to gain control your privacy is that don't talk about it. 
Don't talk about the fact that you want to go to the Grand Canyon or you've been to the Grand Canyon six times in a row. Right. Well, that's going to be a great sign for someone to say, hey, I got this great trip for you in the Grand Canyon. Or, hey, included. we met at the Grand Canyon last July, right? Yeah. I mean, just knowing that is enough. It's enough. And it's like, if you don't talk about it, they can't grab onto it. Now, friends, family, they you need to be able to talk about it with them. That's fine. Just be really careful about talking in public. It's that whole situational awareness. It is. Although, you know, I think there's only so much of that you can really do. So, for example, uh, you know, in, in a corporate situation, you may t be targeted for your role. Yes. Right? They, I mean, all they need to know is that your account's payable at a company, for example. And that's enough for them to craft an attack that seems to be relevant to your job. And that's why you don't put that stuff in LinkedIn. Right, right. And yet, Make something I have it, up. I have it in, in LinkedIn. I mean, you know, anyone in the world could find out what I do for a living and send me an email that seems to be identity related. <laughs> well, same thing with me. I mean, people know exactly what I've done, where I've been. But, you know, when you start talking about that, you and I pay attention to it. We know what to look for. But the average right. person may not. You can also hide what you do. Use a weird name. It right. means the exact same thing as accounts payable, but you're in charge of, you know, you could say, well, I do, you know, charging of payables for whatever. Right. For widgets. And then right. if you see something come in for charging of payables for widgets, you know it's probably a spoof. It's been scraped. Yeah. It's been scraped, scraped and it's a good way. You could say the same exact thing. I mean, I had one com a friend of mine that says she was a Scrivener. Right. You know, it's great. Anybody scrapes that, she knows exactly where it came from. That's quite fascinating. I, I, you know, she was a writer. <laughs> I would like to see, I would like to see some of these sort of techniques put together. Because